I wanted to start with a series on the financial statements to really focus and hopefully give a bit of a foundation of what the financial statements are and you know that base level of financial education that any business owner should have. I think that it's so easy to kind of put your hands up in the air and say, um, I'm not an accountant, I'm not a bookkeeper, this is beyond my scope, you know, I'm the sales piece, I'm the, the business owner and, and creating the product or delivering the service, that's my area of expertise and I'm going to kind of wash my hands of this, but you can't. That's just, it's not acceptable and you as a business owner need to be at some level versed um, in your financials and being able to review and not necessarily prepare them, but be able to ask the questions about what you see. And that's the goal here is that I want to help to give you a bit of that foundation so that you can go to whomever is preparing your financial statements and ask the relevant questions that you need about the trends in your business. Um, I'm not saying you can't trust the professionals. I am a professional. I am a CPA. I've done this for people. I do this for people. But the greater good, the greater goal here is that we deliver as much education um, as possible to support you as business owners. And that's really my intent here. So what I'm going to walk through is an introduction to the balance sheet today. And I'm going to do this over uh, the balance sheet over a series of three posts. Um, yeah, because I'm going to go through each of the components, assets, liabilities and equity. And I don't want to keep these um, as fairly contained as possible because, you know, accounting is boring and that's, <laughs> and that's just the way that it is. So this um, today we're going to focus on the balance sheet only in the asset component and then we'll move on and forward from there. So I have um, Sage Simply Accounting, and this is just a dummy account that I have in my system just to kind of walk through the outline of what the balance sheet is and hopefully just start to trigger with you some areas that relate to your business, make some notes, questions that you might need to ask, um, and you're always welcome to ask me, whether it's within the comments or um, reach out to me via email or on Instagram or on Facebook or you, wherever it is that you're seeing this, please feel free. So this is the balance sheet. And uh, anyone that I talk to when I teach, whether I consult uh, in whatever capacity it is, I always say that the majority of people get so focused on the income statement and the revenue and that net income number and believe that to be the most important of financial statements. But in reality, my opinion as an accountant is that it's this statement right here. It's the balance sheet that tells the picture and the story of your progress from one period to the next. And I will tell you this that at the end of this balance sheet series of videos, you're going to be able to compare one period to the next period and look at those trends and you'll understand why it's so important. Because if your cash is weakening, if your accounts receivable are increasing, if your liabilities are going up, if your equity is decreasing, maybe that doesn't make sense to you right now in this moment, but by the end of it all, it will. And you'll understand exactly how all understanding these components will identify for you which direction your business is going. Okay, Revenue just for one month on an income statement may not necessarily show you that, but your assets and the trends of your liabilities as well will start to give you a picture if period after period there's significant issues that are happening there. And there's no reason, even if you're not in accounting or bookkeeping, why you shouldn't be able to pick up these pieces and ask questions before you prepare your tax return and that's a common issue is that people tend to wait till tax time to get invested in looking at these financials and think about it that could be up to almost a year worth of business and there could be issues and problems buried in your business that are months and months old if you have the access and availability to just review this information yourself if you have an online um, cloud supported system where your bookkeeper or accountant is preparing this information for you on a monthly basis. 125% you should be looking at this one hour a month if that's all you can give. Look at your financials and see where you are landing each and every single month. You can be hands off in so many areas of your business, but not in the financials. So today we're going to focus on the asset portion of the balance sheet and 
hopefully the takeaway for you is some great value. So my dummy company, um, every financial report that you look at will tell you the name of the one that you're looking at. So here we have our balance sheet. And remember that a balance sheet will have an as at date or as of date. And it's your final day of the period. So if it's a monthly, it's the last day of the calendar month. If it's annual, it's the last day of your calendar year. And the important thing to remember is that the balances that you see on a balance sheet carry forward from one period to the next. Think of it like your personal bank statement. When you end January 31st with $5,000 in your checking account, it will roll forward into the statement that you get for February. Okay, whereas an income statement, we wipe it to zero at the end of every month. Okay, we prepare the income statement, show you what your net income or loss was for the period, and then all those accounts get close to zero and we start fresh. But the balance sheet is not the same. It rolls forward. So when you're looking at one and trying to figure out where these numbers are coming from, remember that the amounts are cumulative and continue to carry forward from the day you started your business to the day that you end it. So let's go here the asset section. So the asset section comes first. These are the items of value that a company holds. These are the assets that a company uses in order to generate revenue, cash in the bank, inventory, prepaid assets, the receivables that we're waiting to receive, capital assets, cars, equipment, uh, buildings, land, all of these things. Whatever is of value to the company will be found here within the asset section. Typically, um, we're going we're supposed to break out our assets by current okay so current assets are any assets that are expected to be used within a 12 month period and off the top of our heads we can think of what some of those current assets are the cash in the bank any short-term investments that we might have accounts receivable prepaid expenses car insurance business insurance um, advertising space that we might have to buy uh, a full month's worth, uh, sorry, full year's worth rent if you have to prepay your rent for multiple periods. All that will live within the current asset section of your balance sheet. So if we look here, these are all potential, and this is not exhaustive. There could be many different other accounts that can go um, within your total cash section. So all of these different cash accounts roll up and sum up into this total cash amount. So what's important for you guys to recognize when you look at your own businesses, is there value for you to see each and every single component of cash that you have individually? And the answer to this will depend on the nature and state of your business, okay? If you operate your business completely out of one checking account, then that's wonderful and fine if that gives you enough visibility to see uh, the ins and outs of the cash for your business fantastic if within your bank account you're trying to hold five thousand um, dollars for intended future use it may be beneficial for you to transfer that money into a separate savings account so that you can isolate that five thousand away from the daily operations of your checking account activity if you have foreign currency, obviously that um, will be indicated in a separate bank account, but converted into your local currency and reported um, as well. If you want to try to maintain a petty cash fund, then you would report that separately and uh, have a visibility to what that amount is and you know what the what the amount is at the end of that period as well if you have deposits that you hold on to um, you know if you are posting or your your bookkeepers posting for you and you know that you have these checks that haven't made it to the bank you would post them to this account so you have an awareness that there are X amount of dollars outstanding that need to or that are on their way in transit to being deposited to the um, main checking uh, bank account so hopefully just in this brief explanation, you can see that if you have multiple uses and functions um, and areas where your money actually might be sitting, you may want to report it that way and show it this way and ask to have these accounts created so that you can see exactly um, where this money is living 
and make sure that you know what that 5000 that you might want to use to invest in computer software or some type of uh, special marketing campaign or whatever the case may be but then you can see it separately and know that you have it put away and not use it it's so easy to forget that we had intended um, some use for some money and you get uh, you know, into the daily operations and things happen and things come up and you might, you know, dip into funds that you don't want to use. So it's just something for you to think about, um, you know, are you structuring your cash and your cash management the way you really want to be and that will support the goals that you have for the future. If you have um, a credit card receivable, so if you're accepting credit cards from your customers, those would be reported here as well up until the credit card companies uh, issue the money to you. Investments, pretty straightforward. If you have any, you report them separately. And the most important, in my opinion, is your accounts receivable. I hope that if you have multiple customers and you're issuing invoices and you're giving them 30 days to pay that you have an excellent tracking system. So not just posting to um, this account and looking at it at the end of the period, but to, you're maintaining, you know, separate ledgers, we call them, which are basically schedules that show by customer what invoices are outstanding um, for what PO, for what items, how much, how old or aging that uh, invoice is. And there'll be a separate post on that in itself, just better ways that you can manage that. But monitoring your accounts receivable is truly a maker breaker for um, any business that wants to be successful if you're fortunate enough to have you know revenues and you know if you're not able to collect immediately from your customers if that's not the nature of your business then you must make sure that you are allocating resources towards accounts receivable management you let your if you let your accounts receivables get out of control period over period, I can tell you what will happen and what will happen is that you will have less and less cash in the bank because this money is not coming in and you still will have expenses that need to get paid and this number will continue to decrease because you cannot get this amount in order. It's textbook, that's real life, that's just the way that it goes. When management of accounts receivable is weak, your cash flow will become weak. So if you don't pay attention to your accounts receivable, I highly encourage you to spend as much time as you possibly can focusing on the collection of your receivables um, if you want to see the longevity to your business without question. Prepaid expenses uh, is another one that I think needs just a bit of explanation. So if I buy car insurance, any business insurance, whatever it is, I pay for 12 uh, months worth, let's say it's $5,000. And if I'm preparing monthly financial statements, if you expect uh, in the month where you pay, let's say it's January, if I pay that $5,000 in insurance in January, I cannot expect to see a $5,000 expense item in January on my income statement. And this probably happens to a lot of people. They wonder why, you know, I spent $5,000 on insurance. Why, why am I only seeing just under, you know, 400 for insurance for the month of January? That's because for tax purposes um, and reporting, we don't report the full amount because we're going to use this insurance throughout 12 months. So we have to prorate that 5,000 over each and every single period because that's when we're actually using the benefit. So if you this has happened to you and you've ever wondered why and it hasn't been properly explained, that's the way the treatment actually works. And what you would see is that every month this prepaid asset would, would decrease okay, by whatever that prorated monthly amount is. You would decrease, the, decrease this until you get to the end of the 12th month and then this would be zero. You would no longer have the prepaid. It would no longer have value and you would start again the following January. You'd buy another year's worth and every month you would chip away at this balance until it gets to zero. You use it. You absorb it over each and every period that your business operates. And that's how prepaids work, whether it's rent, insurance, advertising, any other service that you might have for 
for your business. If you use it over the entire year, then you expense it over the entire year as well. That's the rule and that's the way that it works. Inventory, my favorite. If you're a heavy inventory driven business, I can't stress how important it is for you to maintain logs or schedules or tracking depending on how um, uh, complex your business is um, to, you know at what at what scale your business is right now you need to be able to monitor track and trace what you have in terms of inventory what the value is what you bought it at um, you need to be able to perform physical inventory counts to put the closest most accurate um, value for your inventory on your books there's so many different layers and components to inventory valuation, but at the end of the day, you know, we have to remember that things get stolen. We have to remember that things become obsolete and no longer have value, that things uh, get broken and that we have spoilage and all of that stuff. And we have to be able to attach a value to those losses and decrease our inventory by those amounts. Okay, we're, we're saying to whoever's looking at these financial statements, whether it's us or whether we're trying to go to the bank and justify getting us a business loan, or I'm sure many of you have been in this boat, you're trying to expand and you go to the bank and you need to get money. You need to be able to justify these amounts. And depending on the nature of your business, they might ask you if you're a company that's heavy, um, your inventory is heavy in techn technological assets. We know that, you know, technology changes so quickly that the value that something might have in tech at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, the value could be a fraction of what we paid for it. And you need to be able to reduce your inventory by those amounts. So setting up your inventory system in a way that allows you to determine these values, it's so important. And um, I don't know if I said it, but I'll say it again, but also being able to have physical inventory counts. It is imperative that you have some means or some ways to, at the end of the year, look at all the inventory you have, assign a value to it and give it to whoever is preparing your tax return, your bookkeeper, your accountant, whomever that may be. You need to be able to, to, to come to this value, to this asset number for your inventory and that it most accurately um, represents the true market net realizable value of the inventory. If you were trying to sell it at the end of your fiscal period, what would your inventory be worth? So those are just some components to think about for you when it comes to inventory. And it's really um, important if you ever do get an audit that you are able to justify what it is that you're reporting for inventory on your balance sheet. The next one, capital assets. So these are the large items that you might hold. Leases, office furniture and equipment, vehicles, buildings, land, anything of the sort would fall within this capital asset section of your um, uh, balance sheet. So a couple of things to consider here that is that so we buy. So, for example, here, this office furniture and equipment was bought for two thousand. Remember that all assets, pretty much all assets depreciate in value what they're worth when you buy them and what they might be worth two or three years down the road if you tried to sell it at that time are two very different things so what you have to do is come to um, the most relevant and practical amount of amortization or depreciation whichever one you, you want to call it for your asset each year so if you feel that your office furniture and equipment loses value at a rate of 10 or 15 percent per year, you have to make sure that you are taking 10 or 15% of the cost. So here, let's say it's 200 and you would, it would be reported in accumulated amortization as a credit. So negative 200. And when you net the two, then you'll be saying my furniture and equipment is actually worth 1800. And what that says is, you know, or what that shows rather is that you are letting your readers or yourself become aware that your assets are decreasing and if you needed to liquidate or if you needed again to go to the bank to get a loan or something of the sort um you you know this is what you're actually worth i'm not worth four years down the road what i paid for all these assets 
you know, we have to take into consideration the wear and tear, the loss, the depreciation, all of that stuff that happens over time. And like I said, always try to answer the question, if I tried to sell these items today, how much would I possibly get? And what you want to report on your balance sheet as the value is as close to that um, market realizable amount as possible. Okay, if you try to think of it from that perspective, think of it like when you're trying to sell something on Kijiji or let go or whatever the case may be. You know, that figure that you truly know people are willing to spend to buy whatever it is that you're selling. It's the same concept here with your capital assets. What you report and what you show on this balance sheet has to be as close to that amount as possible. Not any amount that you paid X amount of years ago, not the amount that you hope that people are willing to give, to give you. It is what the market realizable value actually is. And you use your amortization to get you to that point. So hopefully that makes good sense. I mean, depreciation and amortization is a topic on itself in itself, but I think that it's important for business owners to really understand that you know, this is the goal here is being accurate, being honest and being transparent because you could get into a lot of trouble by overstating these amounts without question. Um, so you would do the same thing for vehicles. You would do the same things for buildings. They don't depreciate as much as these other items, but you, you still can depreciate the buildings. Uh, land is something that if you own, that it generally does not depreciate. Um, we leave the value typically at whatever we assign when we buy it. There would really need to be extraneous um, circumstances for you to depreciate land because land typically it just doesn't do anything. So unless there's an issue with the land contamination or something serious in that nature, you're really not going to uh, change the the quantity or sorry the amount that you report when you buy. And again, the net amounts of all of these capital assets roll into your total. And then after that, so, and again, in the same way we said that current assets are items you expect to use within 12 months, capital assets are all assets that um, go beyond that 12 month period. And then we have what are called other non-current assets that um, are things like computer software. We don't always know how to treat them. Are we going to hold on to them? Are they going to be valuable within uh, within only 12 months? Are we going to still use it beyond the 12 months? So you could perhaps report it uh, as non-current. It really depends on, on the nature and use that you see for it. Goodwill, if you um, have any, uh, either through the purchase of your business or the setup or work you did um, to generate goodwill for your company, it'll go here. Any other intangibles, trademarks, etc., would come in here as well. Any incorporation costs, if you have an incorporated company, would come under your non-current assets as well. And then you add the sum of your non-current um, capital assets and current assets all together to get your total asset position. And this is, you know, obviously what banks look at. This is what you want to look at. And this is a figure that you hope to see not decrease from period over period, but continue to grow. And this is where the strength in your company um, is shown. Okay, so what your company is worth is, is shown and demonstrated in this value right here. All of the items of value that you use to generate your business live in the asset portion of your balance sheet. So I'm hoping that just in looking at this component of the balance sheet that you're just starting to ask some questions about how you've structured your assets, your cash, your receivables, your inventory. Do you have enough visibility to show you period over period what your trends are? And that really is the goal here. And like I said, by the time we get to the end of this balance sheet series, um, you will be able to look at the trends for your company period over period and really make sense of you know, the choices and the strategies that you're making. And that's really the ultimate goal. The balance sheet tells the story of your business and the choices that you're making and how you manage cash, how you manage your receivables, what you're doing with your inventory, um, where you're spending your money on in terms of long-term assets. And the balance sheet will give you this picture. So I hope that you've taken away some points here and you have questions and you ask me or you ask your bookkeeper or your account, whomever the case may be, 
but you're, you know, the wheels are starting to turn and you're starting to see um, where you need to become maybe a little bit more invested in developing your own financial education. Thank you.